Rebel Force Radio presents... Experimental Unit Clone Force 99. The defective clones with the uh, desirable mutations. They call themselves the Bad Batch. The Bad Batch. This is the Bad Batch. After Show. After Show. Man, I tell you what, if I was going to pick a character to deliver the kind of ambiguity and half-truths that this episode is filled with, it would be Asajj Ventress. The perfect character, I think, to be the Harbinger. And we're going to break it all down here. We're talking about the Harbinger Season 3, Episode 9, The Bad Batch this week. It really, really is, I think... A pivotal episode. There's not a lot that happens, to be honest. It's not like there's just a bunch of there's some action, of course, but it all kind of it almost feels like it takes place on in, in one day. But there's some great dialogue, and there continues to be great character momentum, build up, and payoffs. That's the one thing I am just loving about this show, is that almost everything they set up, they pay it off. And I gotta tell you. We've been sort of beating around the bush a little bit with this because we're talking about an animated series and we're coming off of Ahsoka and Mando season three. We're about to go into the Acolyte. But I think all of those writers, I think all of those creatives on those live action shows, they need to talk to guys like Stuart Lee, Matt Mcnavitz. They need to talk to people like Jennifer Corbett because I think they're doing something here on Bad Batch that they're not doing in the live action series since really since Mandalorian season two. So anyway, so much to talk about. It's going to be a great discussion, live call-in show, Rebel Force Radio. Some of you are new to the program, and if you are, and introductions are in order, my name is Jason, and with me, as always, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. Just catching up on some last-minute reading here, uh, taking a look at uh, Star Wars Dark Disciple. And uh, I'm, I'm just at the final, at the end of the book here, and I'll be damned Asajj Ventress dies in this book. What the heck? This thing's supposed to be... Wait a second. I don't need these. Uh, This thing's supposed to be canon. Dark Disciple. And Asajj dies at the end. So uh, you'd think that... Well, how uh, definitive, Jim? How definitive is this death? Is there something... I mean... Well, I was going to say we'll get into it this week on the Bad Batch after show. (laughs) All right. Well, definitely because I just it. finished it, and you know what? It has taken me a while to come around to this book, and I'll be damned, it's really, really good. It's a great book, and um, there are things in here that happen, and uh, among them, uh, the death of Asajj Ventress. But this book's supposed to be canon, actually. This book is based on episodes of the clone wars that went unproduced after the show was canceled those episodes actually written by katie lucas herself george's daughter so uh proved to be a great asset i think to the clone wars writing team yeah and she took a lot of crap she took a lot of crap online and um you know there were all kinds of accusations being thrown about nepotism and all of that but i i really enjoyed the episodes that katie was involved in she did a lot of the darth maul stuff it was great she had the chops and the apple didn't fall far from the tree i wonder what katie's up to these days but uh this book dark disciple she actually did the foreword for it and uh she wrote for the clone wars for about 10 years starting with the episode jedi crash and ending with the unproduced Dark Disciple scripts. And, of course, then those scripts were turned into this novel. And uh, it's essential. I would say this book is essential. After, you know, finally getting caught up with it. It's been out for a while and sitting on my shelf. And I finally decided to uh, read it to prep for these episodes featuring the return of Asajj. I am glad that you brought the book up because if I was doing this solo i would never bring the book up because the 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 canon in the in the books whether they're post disney acquisition part of the new expanded universe or the old doesn't matter to me 
Yeah. And I, but I, but I recognize and respect the fact that it does matter to a lot of people, especially since they went so far out of their way in 2012 when they discontinued and shelved the old EU and said, "Well, the problem with that stuff is that it's not, it can't be canon because it can't line up with what we have in store." And here they are, um, what, uh, 12 years later. It's hard to do math in public, folks. 12 years later, and they're sort of up to the same tricks. But, Jim, one thing we know about Dave Filoni, and he's continued, I don't know how much day-to-day he has on Bad Batch, but he's the executive producer, and I think he has set the culture and the tone for Lucasfilm Animation. And uh, Dave Filoni was never beholden to uh, Expanded Universe in the past, so why should he be beholden to it now when he's got a good idea or someone on his team has a good idea? Yeah, something he learned from his mentor, George Lucas himself. (laughs) Exactly. George exactly. didn't give a crap about what publishing was making, except when the checks showed up. Uh, you know, <laughs> they, 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 the Brinks truck showed up in his house right. filled with cash. But, um, you know, it's uh, it, it was Dave Filoni who actually made the suggestion that Asajj Ventress should be brought into the Bad Badge. There was a great uh, interview that showed up on StarWars.com today featuring... Oh, really? Yeah, featuring Nika Futterman, the voice of oh. Asajj Ventress. Was she and awesome or what? You know, we got to know her during those Clone Wars years. Yeah. What a fun, fun, and nice person. Love oh, yeah. And, and she has a punk rock edge just like Asajj Ventress. Yeah, for does sure. Too, yeah. Something I always appreciated. But um, Nika, uh, you know, within this interview on StarWars.com, there are tidbits revealed about the show itself and one of those tidbits was it was dave filoni who brought this idea to the showrunner jennifer corbett and the writing staff that asajj ventress can be brought back there was a lot of debate going on within the writers room about uh how they can do it and how they can do it without foiling the narrative in star wars Dark. so they're aware right they're aware oh yeah and and that's probably why they went with this piece today, because there's all kinds of brouhaha amongst those watching the series saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. And, and and I, and yeah, go well, ahead. Sorry. Can I do the spoilers? Should we do the spoiler alert so oh, I can talk we? about the end of the book? All right, let's do it. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Right, if you haven't read this, uh, what, 10 year old book, uh, you've been warned. <laughs> it actually came out in 2015. Okay. So nine years. Nine year book. But um, <laughs> the way Asajj uh, dies in this book is um, she and Quinlan Voss, they have a relationship in this. Oh. Uh, Romance Asajj. in Star Wars? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> there they are, right on the Look front cover. Oh. And you can see Asajj has the hairdo. So it's nothing new. That hairdo goes yeah. back to the front cover of Dark, Dark Disciple 2015. And there she is with good old Quinlan. There she is. And she also has the yellow saber, too. Oh, do you see it? No, you see it on the back. Yeah. There you see it. The on yellow the back. saber before the yellow saber was cool, before it was the, the saber color of, of choice now, which it seems like we're being inundated with yellow sabers, Jim. But that's hey, nine listen. years ago. To me, the origin of the yellow lightsaber goes back to the vintage Star Wars original 12 action figures that featured Luke Skywalker with a yellow plastic saber. And also on the card art uh, for the Obi-Wan Kenobi action figure, it oddly had a yellow saber. Ben was... uh, yeah, he right. Had a yellow saber, and, and it was those an inflatable in- saber that came inflatable out. Inflatable yep. saber. I got it. And me and Billy Mac had those. And oh, did we have a good time <laughs> dueling, dueling? You know. But what I mean um, is, you know how, like, especially in this sort of meme culture, where th- where something becomes a thing. Blue milk became a thing. It's a right. trap. Became a thing. I'm yeah. starting to look at the blue or the yellow saber as. A thing now. Yes. Yeah. We saw Ray with it at the end of the Rise of Skywalker. We're seeing them in the Acolyte trailer now. All over the place. Yeah. And we, we're seeing Asajj Ventress in this episode of The Bad Batch swinging around a yellow blade. So she and Quinlan Boss, she's working as a bounty hunter. And that was established in the Clone Wars, in the series, that after she uh, departed, uh, Dooku stopped being. Um, mentored by him and she turned her back on all of that stuff she became a bounty hunter 
she acquired the yellow lightsaber uh, while she was uh, tooling around in some, uh, you know, black markets, right? And um, so she scored it that way. And um, and so she, she operated as a bounty hunter who was swinging around a yellow blade. She met Quinlan Voss, who was undercover hunting Count Dooku. This is all during the Clone Wars era. Mm-hmm. Quinlan Voss is hunting down Count Dooku, and he is in disguise as a bounty hunter. He and Asajj meet. They go to uh, Dathomir. She trains him in the dark side of the Force. She shows him the dark Force ways. And he, he slides a little bit. He slips into... Uh, you know, negative territory. He becomes a dark sider himself to a degree. Um, they hunt Dooku and they have uh, two encounters with him. The second encounter didn't end so well for Asajj. She went to protect uh, Quinlan Voss and soaked in a ton of Count Dooku's Sith lightning. So mm-hmm. she was out, she was done, and she passed away. Obi Wan and and Quinlan Vos, a, a redeemed Quinlan Vos in the eyes of the Jedi Council, they then several months later take the body of Asajj to Dathomir, to like this enchanted cavern and and there's waters there, and they place her body into the waters and she kind of sinks into it like Ahsoka did when oh, she was yeah. in the World Between Worlds, very similar mental imagery was coming to my mind as I was reading this and they say all of that, you know, green mist that accompanies the night sisters, you know, uh, mother Towson would, would generate the green mist. It was, Uh, we we, we saw it on Ahsoka, the the green mist. Well, a little bit with that weird, uh, Merrick, um, whatever he was. Yeah. But remember when they would do, uh, where, where they would, they would appear and they would communicate and they, they didn't look like regular holograms. They had sort of a green misty look to them. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So yeah. Sort of like yeah. a symbol the of their power. Do that. Yeah. The night sisters do that. So, um, Obi-Wan and Quinlan notice all this green mist coming out of the waters in that cavern and they walk away from it, you know, assuming a, they hear the voices of the night sisters welcoming the sister back, you know, but who knows uh, where those night sisters were? I'm sure it's all going to come into play here when it finally gets explained. According to the StarWars.com article today, showrunner for the Bad Batch, Jennifer Corbett, says, we had several discussions about the book and how her story could continue. How she survived will be revealed in future content. But for this hmm. story, we're thrilled to include her and explore her unique connection to and compassion for Omega. So they say future content. They don't say in a future episode of the bad batch, I would be surprised Mm -hmm. if season three comes and goes and we don't have Asajj return in some way, shape or form. But um, when they say future content, that that indicates wide open, isn't it? Yes. Yes. And there was some talk that, a fan met Nika at a signing somewhere or at a convention or something. And she said, Hey, what you see in the bad batch is just the beginning for new stories for Asajj. Ooh. So yeah. Hey, what so about a Nika, tales from the Jedi at some point? You know, that might, you might be right on with that. We don't have a release date for season two of tales of the Jedi, but we've been told that we will see it in 2024. So that could be the future content they're referring to, mm. or it could be whatever the next series is for Star Wars animation. I mean, real series, not shorts, like right. Tales of the Jedi is. It sounds to me, based on what you were recounting in the book, that the fact that they laid her down in that water, yeah, they were maybe leaving the door open for, for yeah. something down the line. So... Yeah, I, I, it, it, at least that's the way it sounds to me. That and these are based the on scripts. Right. These are based on scripts for the Clone Wars that never got made. So I don't know if they were looking to necessarily. Maybe then they were thinking about putting a definitive 
ending to Asajj Ventress. The, the novel makes it seem like she's dead as a doornail. But, you know, that mm. green mist, it does open up the door a little bit. And yeah. I'm sure that's going to come into play whenever they eventually explain what happened to Asajj and how she was able to survive. You know, the As- Asajj is definitely one of those characters that I could really get behind seeing in live action. Mm-hmm. To be honest. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think she's earned it in the same way that Ahsoka has earned it. She's an older character than Ahsoka Tano. She started yeah. out in the Gendi series. Remember? I am Sith. <laughs> <laughs> you know I love it when you talk like a son. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, let's uh let's get into thank you for that. That's a great prologue to this episode, The Harbinger, season three, episode nine, directed by Stuart Lee, uh written by Jennifer Corbett and uh, story editor Matt McDevitz. And I, I saw a comment, like, why does Swank always read the the the, the creators or the, the writers' names? It's something that I I, t- I tell you, I my my one of my idols, Frank Sinatra, would always intro his songs because he wasn't a songwriter. He would always intro his songs with who wrote it, who did the lyrics, and who did the orchestration. He always wanted to give credit to the artists behind the songs, and I like that as well because we talk about this stuff. And yes, it's content, but there are people that really put their blood, sweat, and tears into this stuff. So I like giving them a little bit of props. So and I really like that my podcasting partner is the Frank Sinatra of Star Wars <laughs> podcasts. <laughs> well, I you've always been that. the Dean Martin, so I'll be the Sinatra. Uh, this right, episode uh, de- <laughs> debuted on March 27th, 2024, ran just a little bit over 27 minutes, clocking in at 2740, sans final credits. And... Um, Great episode. Really enjoyed it. I tell you, right out of the gate, um, I got a little chuckle because of that scene on that dock on Pabu when uh, when Wrecker was uh, kind of given uh, a crosshair, a little bit of business about about making friends, you know, like, uh, oh, yeah. look at you making friends, you know, <laughs> uh, and, you know, he just hates it. But what I like about it and Jim, what I was saying at the top of the episode is that. It's not like they just, oh, Crosshair's good again, and they drop it. They keep giving you little moments, just even just one line of dialogue. That's what I think is so good about this show. Mm -hmm. I really feel that they pay off everything, from Wrecker's headaches to Crosshair's destiny to Sid's duplicity. Everything is paid off. It might, you know, like with Sid's duplicity, it might take a little longer than what we want. You know, our patients might wear thin a little bit. That's why I'm convinced that Crosshair's hand, there will be a definitive answer. We kind of got it, but I have enough faith in the writers that it's going to come back and there will be a satisfying payoff. But I really do think that this show shines with the way that it writes these characters. Just yeah, it, absolutely. It, it, allows, it allows the characters to be human. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone knows you just can't flip a switch and and go from being one way to another way without there being some sort of repercussions uh, via, you know, via the way others treat you or everything that's up in your head. There's the conflict and it just doesn't go away just like that. And uh, yeah, exactly. And also I think by record saying that it allows us as an audience to see that crosshair is still going through that internal struggle yeah right it's like he catches himself doing nice things and he's embarrassed or something yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) he hopes no one sees (laughs) how can someone who has such a slimy sounding voice (laughs) do such wonderful things for others you know what i think and i guess i would have to have you know pulled some audio but i felt that it was a little less slithery this week a little, less slithery. a little less slithery. Well, I think D. Bradley Baker's greatest performance in this episode has to be Batcher. I mean, he brought it all <laughs> oh, for man. Batcher. And his, he, we had barking. We had whimpering. We had <laughs> panting. We had everything you require from your lurka hound being, um, He's lassie. being supplied in this episode. I, I'm telling you, he is lassie for the Bad Batch. Uh, you know, what do you, oh, what, he what is. do you smell? What do you smell? What? There's a, yeah, there's a, yeah. there's a Sith witch here. What? And we also discovered Lurka hounds can be used as a mount. I guess if you're small enough. Right. I yeah. mean, even as a kid, 
my Labrador retriever would not let me jump on her back no matter what. So I thought that, you know, they're <laughs> sturdy hounds. Lurka hounds are sturdy. Yeah. You know, there was a line here about the, the M count and uh, they keep, again, they, 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 because it is an animated series and because they are, I think, targeting a sl- slightly younger audience, they do tend to bring these things back up. They're good reminders, but um, they're talking about, you know, if the contact, they're like, well, we still haven't heard from Fennec Shand. If the contact uh, can tell us what an M count is, we might figure out why the Empire is targeting Omega. And Crosshair sort of is the voice of the audience in some ways. And he said something that was on my mind. He goes, does it matter? We're not handing it over. She's like, why does it really matter? It's not like they go, oh, this is why you want her. Okay, well, here she is. Yeah. But uh, Hunter says, no, we can't be prepared if we don't know what we're dealing with. Again, the, the strong writing where they create an in-world reason to give the viewer more information. And that was sort of the role that, you know, instead of just assuming we all know th- th- what the M count is and, the, and that we've been following since the rise of Skywalker, this, this cloning plot of Palpatines, they continue to, unlike Ahsoka did, they continue to talk to the audience that's not quite as up to speed with everything. And I like that. Well, even before the sequels, we were hearing talk about M count midichlorians sure. in the prequels. So we were I I don't know. I'm just really anxious for someone to say the word midichlorian. No one say has it yet, right? Say it. It's not no, you're right. Kill no. you. <laughs> but I mean it? it does it creates that mystery around what exactly the issue is with Omega. And why does Hunter do it? You know? I think Crosshair brings up a good point. Mm-hmm. Who cares what M count means? It's not going to change our perspective on it. It's not going to make us turn her over to the Empire. It, that's not going to happen. What? Why are we wasting all this energy and time trying to crack the M count code? Right. But Hunter yeah. wants to know because you know why? I think it's because it's a, a mystery that's haunting Omega to a degree. Where she, you know, he's doing it for her. She really wants to know. Yeah, it's not going to change their approach to anything, but it could provide some answers that would help them unlock certain things with Omega herself. So it's not a necessarily about the Empire, one hundred percent. Right, that's right. It's about discovering, and Omega actually says it. To Ventress at one point, she says, I, I want to know what I am. Yes. And and Hunter is keenly aware of this and sensitive to that fact. He's a good dad at the yeah. end of the day. He's trying to provide for Omega. And he's he's, you know, if it takes sacrifice to do it, he'll do it. Yeah, for for sure. For sure. Um but I just like that they they we're getting some messages here on the chat saying, no, they did say it. And I don't know if they're talking about this episode or a previous episode. Maybe it was said by someone in the lab. I don't remember Ventress the batch. Ventress said midi-chlorians? She did not. No, not no, no, no. They're episode. saying that they've said it on the show. But I don't think the Batchers have heard it. I think that might maybe Pershing or somebody. Um, All right, well, ever since the term M count has come into play, I don't believe we've heard the word midichlorians being used. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think we have. Yeah, I didn't think so either. I didn't think so either. Um, so, uh, yeah. Jason's Ventress. looking at his yeah. notes, Thilo. He's not looking at his crotch. Sorry, now <laughs> I'm distracted by why, why, why? Who said I was looking at my crotch? Thilo Grimm. <laughs> why is Jason looking at his crotch all the time? <laughs> Look at his notes. Everyone knows it. Can't you hear him shuffling around the papers? Got him right here, man. This is my- hey, Swank. I'm gonna take some of the heat off of you. Okay. <laughs> Woo. Oh, Woo. Lord. Where are my glasses? I need them. Well, what was his name? Hilo. 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 Thilo. Thilo. Maybe Thilo. Thilo. Like- Thilo. Yeah. If you're when you're blessed like me, you'd be staring at it all the time too. So uh- it's double bladed. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how that would work. I don't but, either. <laughs> it just seemed like a funny thing to say. Oh, 
All right, so here's a question that I have. Was, was we were talking at the end of last episode about whether or not, you know, did who was Fennec Shan talking to at the end? That transmission, that transmission was yes. obviously um, uh, encrypted because it sounded weird. Yeah. It's definitely Assange Ventress. So you got to help yeah. me out. I didn't go back and look at it. When, when, when they parted ways with Fennec, they weren't on Pabu, right? They were not on Pabu no, because she no, says no. something to now we know it's Ventress about, oh, you should you should get the coordinates or I should be able to send you the coordinates or something like that. Hmm. I don't recall the coordinates being brought up. Yeah. Or Where location or they should be easy to find. What, what, oh, there was oh, something oh. about them being about them being found. I might have it. Yeah. Well, you know, Assange just said she knew how to track and we know that Sith are are very powerful it, it, with their tracking abilities. That's revealed in the Phantom Menace. I know Asajj isn't a Sith, but she studied under one, and so maybe some of that stuff. We know a lot of oh. Sithy things rubbed off on Ventress. Yes, uh, here was the line. This was Fennec. She says, "I'm sure you can track them down easily enough. I'll send you what I have." So there it is. So she was able to follow the clues. But you're right, Jim. Asajj Ventress, with her experience. She can track people down and things like that. So I'm not too wrapped around the axle about that. But nonetheless, she found them and she does say to them, you know, getting back to this, this, the name of this episode, Harbinger, what is a Harbinger? A Harbinger announces or indicates the approach of something. And I went back and I looked at all of the things that Ventress sort of prophesies and it starts with, she says, you're very reckless to inquire about such things when she's confronting the batch about why they're even looking into M count. Um, so then that took me back to, yeah, that's right. It felt like that conversation between her and Fennec was encrypted. And I speculated as to why. And I said, well, of course, this is this is black ops stuff. And they're going to be monitoring. The Empire is going to be monitoring mon uh, monitoring communications for Keywords. We know our own government does that in the real world. They monitor communications for keywords, you know, like terrorism and things like that. So they're looking for keywords, and if somebody says M count or midichlorian or something, boom, target on your back. And that's definitely uh, one of her first sort of harbingers. The other one is um, she says, but if you do have a high M count, consider yourself warned. The Empire will hunt you down. Um, and then she confronts the batch and says, uh, whatever you're planning on doing, it won't end well for you. Think carefully. How do you want this to go? She says the Empire is more dangerous than you could possibly fathom. So the whole script, Jim, is is just peppered with, um, oh, if Omega did have that potential, she'd have to be trained, which would mean leaving you behind. What you want is irrelevant. It's full of prophecies and foreshadowing of what's happening, and none of it is good. So Ventures comes in, episode nine, and pretty much tells the audience, if the batch continue the path that they're, that they're on, it's going to be a disaster. And, of course, I think we know that this is a tragedy in the making. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's not going to end up well. I don't think it's going to end up well for any of the characters on this show. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's the, the harbinger of, of bad news. You know, it's, it's the omen. It's the sign of, uh, bad, she's she's a, a bad moon on the rise. Path. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and Asajj, I guess, presents that in, uh, some, some sort of way, you know, just by physically being there, it's. I mean, in the history of Star Wars animation, it traditionally has, has been bad news whenever Asajj Ventures showed up. Um, she I, is I the black the, cat of the Star Wars universe, isn't she? She really is. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> she did She did help out Ahsoka, though, in the Clone Wars. Um, she was tracking. I, I remember she and Ahsoka had an encounter on level 1313. And mm. um, Asajj actually... Uh, helped her out it's when she was on the run you know in season five and uh, asajj did help her out in that episode and i think that was her way of kind of you know burying the hatchet but um you know so I, it, there's been redemption for the character and mm -hmm. and in this book dark disciple you do root for her 
which is something I, I never felt like I was ever doing when it came to Asajj Ventress. I never was rooting for her. And uh, so that provides me with a little bit of a different perspective on the character and uh, shows that the character has evolved over time. So were you glad? Uh, let me just ask you, were you glad to see her pop up in Bad Batch? Oh, that's a good question. Was I glad to see her pop up? Was she somebody? Um, was she a character that you were hoping would have a, a, a future in no, the modern no. storyteller? Did it not even cross your mind? No. Well, it, it probably didn't cross my mind, but it was nothing I was like, I didn't desire to see more of the character necessarily. Mm. You were fine just to just, leave her where she was. Yeah. I yeah, mean, she just, yeah. but it was, it was kind of open ended until the book Dark Disciple. Mm -hmm. um, she was working as a bounty hunter. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of interesting places you can take the character. And it was something that Nika Futterman was really into also. She wanted to see where this was going with Asajj. You, you make her a bounty hunter. You can take that story in almost any direction. Yeah, and, right. Uh, Nika, yes. Nika was down with that, and then the show got canceled. So, yeah. um, <laughs> right. But it looks like Asajj is definitely, uh, she's been resurrected, and I expect we will be seeing uh, much more of the character. Um, so... This first confrontation, or, or, or not confrontation, but this first conversation that she has with the Bad Batch, um, you know, I've heard, I hear you've been asking questions about M Count, very reckless to inquire about such things. It attracts the wrong kind of attention. Yeah. And then they ask, and why is that? And I love this line. She says, well, that's the real question, isn't it? So like, she's saying, look, that's the million dollar question. And it's almost like this is the question nobody's really asking is why is the empire obsessed with M count with, mm -hmm. with midichlorian count? And I started to think, well, we know we have the purge going on, the, the, but, but then it was like, well, the purge is really about, as far as we know, the purge is really about former Jedi extinguishing all of the Jedi that are left. And that's why you have Vader and the inquisitors but then there's this other loose thread, this other loose end, which is force sensitives. And I think that they're, I don't think they're the same thing. I don't think the inquisitors are necessarily out there killing babies, toddlers, teenagers. I don't think they're, they're on that. I think that that would be, I think it'd be a much more covert way. Remember with the Kenobi series, there was nothing really subtle about the inquisitors. They would show up on a planet intimidate the hell out of people and force them to give up the person that they were that they were harboring or they were protecting with something like monitoring communications hearing words like midichlorian m count and just looking in general for force sensitive beings i think that would have to be a little bit more subtle because the empire they can't have they can't have their their thugs coming in and ripping babies out of the arms of mothers and, and and killing them. They they can't do that because at this point in time, as you I think it was Jim you mentioned last week, like the Empire, they're, they're heroes in some ways to the general public. They they brought order, they brought peace, stability, and all of that to the galaxy. So this whole hunting down M count, high M count, um, this is something really really evil. And Ventress talks about it later. And she says, you have no idea. You have no idea how bad it really is. And everyone in the chat is saying Ventress has, she uttered the word midi-chlorian in this very episode. And uh, I'm sure somebody will call in when we open up the switchboard and let us know exactly where in this episode it happened. But it got by me. I mean, got and by I was, me too. I, I thought I was listening closely. There are times when I get distracted thinking about dreamy Dr. Hemlock and <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, sometimes my mind drifts and I'm not, you know, marking every word that's being said in the show, but you know, I mean, Hemlock, you know, here, here, so here uh, I am looking at my crotch again, looking for the word <laughs> I don't see it in my crotch. Um, Stop. <laughs> she does say, something that is not really surprising to us. It might have surprised us. It may have surprised us before where she says it's something in the blood. Everyone has it, but at varying levels. And I was looking, thinking back to Qui-Gon sitting outside 
the uh, Skywalker homestead there and testing Anakin's blood. By the way, testing M count was a lot simpler back in the days of the prequels. You, you, you just had it like right on your iPhone. You just opened up the midichlorian testing app and you, you got the blood and you send it off to Obi-Wan. Now, like there's, I, I couldn't believe that Ventress didn't just pull out some device. She actually has to go through these exercises, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. But Jim, did we always know, did we always believe back in when the midichlorians were a new concept that they were in everyone's blood? Yes. That and was they always are in everyone's blood. Well, we know I, I that the Force is in all living things, but did Qui-Gon make it clear that everybody has midichlorians no. back in episode one? No. No, definitely not. Definitely not. It was, I, I think George Lucas himself did in certain interviews that he yeah. gave. Yeah, probably. Yeah, but I don't think that was ever a, a, a point, a subject being discussed in the dialogue from Qui-Gon. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, you know, coming right out here in, in, in universe saying that everyone has it, but at varying levels, those with a high count were believed to be more capable of wielding the force. So this is all this stuff, the subtext that we've been talking about that's now being stated explicitly in dialogue in a Star Wars show. All the stuff we've been talking about on after shows, uh, whether it be about Sabine and Ahsoka, what have you, it's just interesting to hear it like they're talking right to us. Yeah, that's right. All right. Midichlorians. In this episode. <laughs> oh, you got it. All right. I, All right. I, 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 I looked up the, uh, the, the transcript here mm -hmm. of the episode. And, um, and there's, it's a, it happens in a back and forth right before Asajj starts testing Omega. Okay. And um, she says, uh, oh. Your blood doesn't make you a Jedi. You have to be trained for that. And I've never known a clone to be force sensitive, but clearly none of you are normal. Omega says, you got that right. And, and uh, Asajj says, the Kaminoans did make millions of you, so I, get, I suppose it's possible. But if you do have a high M count, consider yourself warned. The Empire will hunt you down. And uh, then it goes on. Uh, she says, move, child. Oh, and then Omega says, so is that why the Empire's been after me? And then here it is. Asaj says, I can't determine your midi-chlorian levels there without testing you. And then Omega says, well, then test me. I can handle it. Right over my head it went. And it's interesting that Omega hears the word midi-chlorian, but doesn't say something like, Oh, so that's what the M and M count means. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't most kids do that? Wouldn't they react that way when they discover something? Oh, M, midichlorian. And then she said, well, what's a midichlorian? <laughs> oh, let me tell you what a midichlorian is, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, there I am again. Um, hold on. God damn it. I can't, I'm out of sync with my face. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you laugh, Swank. Uh, give you something to look at other than your Dr. Qui-Gon, are you surprised that here we are all these years talking about midichlorians, a concept that you were the first to reveal to us? Well, you know, Swank, uh, I always knew it would go mainstream someday, you know. That's why I am now marketing the M-Count app. You can get it at the <laughs> iPhone store or at Google Play. Is Google Play still around? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Know. It's a thing. You might want to get make sure your app's in there. I canceled my subscription. Just like I'm going to cancel you, Swank, you little <laughs> bastard. <laughs> I love, I love how quickly he. <laughs> I love how quickly he he he, he jumps to anger. Uh, Qui Gon. No, it's not anger. It's just frustration. Oh, frustration! There's he, a know, difference. He's a Jedi Master. He doesn't. He doesn't let himself uh, get angry. Uh, Yoda just, never does mention frustration. He says anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Frustration, totally valid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. If you're just a little frustrated, you know, you're good to go. You know, you still be a Jedi. Nobody's going to take away your membership card, you know. All right. Let's get back to our analysis. Right, let's get back to it. Let's talk about these tests. We don't have uh, Master Qui-Gon's app. We don't have that little... Uh, 
a little uh, communication device that was made out of a lady's razor, I believe, uh, when they were yeah, in the Yeah, right, pickles. right. It was. It, it was, was like a lady bic something. Yeah. But uh, so let's talk about the test. Test number one, we see uh, Omega, and it's the uh, it's the thumbnail for this week's this week's episode uh, with the apple. Well, it's not an apple, but with the uh, fruit on her head and uh, doing this uh, sort of one legged uh, stand. Now, Jim, I have uh, I shouldn't even make a joke about it. I was going to say I've stood, at the, I've stood at the side of the road next to my car with a police officer asking me to do a very similar exercise to this. But, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm seriously, I was like, what did she do? Are they testing for midichlorians and balance or is this a sobriety test? Um, because <laughs> this one confused me. It really confused me because she says, how does standing on one leg have anything to do with M count? She says, you're focused on the wrong thing. Stop trying to have balance. Let your let go of your conscious mind. Conscious mind, I don't even know what that means, which is kind of a cute little line about, you know, that's something we've heard, you know, uh, let go, let go your conscious self and focus on mm-hmm. instinct, you know. Um, but what is, the, if this is not about balance, what the hell is this exercise about? Well, no, I mean, it, it's about letting yourself go. I mean, if you're balancing yourself, you're going to react. If you feel yourself going left or right, forward or backward, you want to stay on that one foot. She's trying to teach Omega to just let go of all of that. Stop trying to coordinate your mind and your body and mm. just let yourself go to the force and you will be still, you will be balanced. You won't have to to struggle against gravity. All of that stuff <laughs> Okay, I, I see. irrelevant. Once she you threw me off when she court. said, "You're focused on the wrong th- on the wrong thing. Stop trying to have balance." So, right, just like Obi Wan was sort of like, "Stop trying to fire the perfect shot." It's almost like you have to almost not think about it in some ways, and let and get out of the way and let the force do the work. The, you have to get your conscious mind out of it. Stop trying to control things. So, okay, so test number one, balance, Omega fails. Oh, yes. Well, you know, it seemed like she was getting the hang of it, and then she got distracted. Yes. Because the Batchers were talking about uh, massage <laughs> and everything. and The helicopter you know, they, dads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> over yeah, there. They're pulling out the iPad, showing, <laughs> you know, look at this social media search I did here. That's her. That's the right. assassin. The separate background assassin. checks. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and Asajj was picking up on this, and it, it, it distracted Omega. So she fell or, or lost her balance. Several but it seemed times. like she was very steady there for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I also liked um, Wrecker cheerleading her, you know, like just, you can do it, Omega. You know, can you imagine yeah. if, if someone was on Dagobah shouting at Luke as he was trying to levitate the stone? Um, more distraction and more and again I, I think yeah. this is kind of a, a shout out to the karate kid movies mm. and uh, you know how that he would always oh, when have he's on the beach doing stance. the yep you know that's yeah. that's the classic karate kid stance so yeah so there's you there's know there's i think the, as yeah. is making up these tests as she goes along you know is this she? is yeah these are her like she has come up with these tests herself because she wasn't a Jedi, she wasn't a Sith. She does. She doesn't have one of those midi chlorian testing kits. She <laughs> is just, you know, she's just working on her own. And this is how she's determined. These are good ways to decipher whether or not you're dealing with a Force sensitive, is by having them go through these practices. And and like Luke Skywalker in Last <laughs> Jedi. <laughs> you know, I, I, I hate referring to that movie because people get freaked out. But Luke had three tests that right. he was giving to Ray. So I think this is kind three of three lessons. Lessons, whatever. Th- this is kind of consistent with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're right. They find out through text. But tech gets a name drop in almost uh, every episode. I, I think there has been a. Of course, our uh, audience will tell us, but I, I really feel that there has been a name check of tech in almost every episode this mm-hmm. season. And yeah. here was this week's. I checked tech's files from the Republic Archives. You were right. It's her. And they call her a separatist assassin. And I, yes. I paused on that, and I was like, 
Oh no, that fits. That's that's pretty pretty accurate. That's oh, exactly that's, what she was. <laughs> sums it all up right there. <laughs> right. But you know, she 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 did have a past as a a Jedi youngling. She was in the temple for a while. And uh mm-hmm. from what I believe, I mean, um, you know, and uh she uh why would she leave the order though? These are th- oh, her master was killed. That's right. Yes, her master, Kai Merrick. The name just came back to me thanks to this wow. book. But, wow. <laughs> you know, it's fresh. Yeah. And then, yeah, he died. And she was then, who did she end up with after that? I don't know. It doesn't matter. So but, she really has you know, bounced around here. She's been bounced Wars around Galaxy. from the Jedi to the Sith to the bounty hunters to the Damn. bad bad. I mean, she's really she's worn a lot of hats. She's made the round. Um, well, all right. Before we get into test number two, uh, we do have some super chats. And by the way, this is a call-in show, 708-866-1737. We got a jam-packed switchboard uh, already, which is great. Tyler Page, our fantastic uh, screener, he's he's here. But look at him. Look at him fast at work, hard at work. And uh, I hate to break it to you listening on audio podcast, but there's no beard. Well, there no is beard a beard. On well, you know, it's, this is like 5 o'clock shadow. He's got I mean, the, for he's Tyler's got the stash standard. going, no, but yeah, but that's, yeah. There, is, there is facial hair present. Well, a sure, fine mustache. But, I mean, he's, he's, he's fantastic. He's still but, yeah. uh, you know, Tyler, he'll, he'll have that full beard back in two weeks. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we were we were just talking pre-show, you know, no beard for Bristol. Nope. No beard for Bristol, just beers. Yeah. Beers for Bristol, <laughs> not beers. Beards. No beard for Bristol. That's my favorite Beastie Boys song. <laughs> Dear, uh, Tyler, we, did, we did mean to interrupt. We know you're doing a great job screening the calls, so uh, we'll we'll leave you to it. But did want to show off the uh, the chin, and you got that little dimple. You got the Mark Hamill dimple yeah. on the chin. Look at you. <laughs> That's a high midichlorian count right there. You can tell. <laughs> yeah, is the dimple. Thanks. All right, man. Um, super chats. That's right. That's where we were. Here's Sal B. Crum, always here with us. Uh, very kind. He said, didn't watch yet, so I'm out of here. Can't wait to watch and listen to the replay. Thanks for all the content, gents. That's so nice. I like when people drop by, even oh, cool. just to say hi, because they haven't yeah. seen the episode yet, and they're like, all right, I'm going to go watch the episode, then they'll you can't even watch. And- you can't even watch our uh, after show right now, live. But he'll catch up. He'll catch up. That yeah. That's super nice. Thank you, Seth. Jonathan Tilly says, chut, chut, always a blast listening to y'all. Awesome to see Ventress back and Crosshair being protective. If any Star Wars book is worth the read, Dark Disciple is a must. So another vote for Dark Disciple. And Jim's showing it off right here. And it is still available, I'm sure, wherever fine books are sold. Uh, We got Phil. Oh, Phil. I'm not going to read your full name. Phil says, love the pacing of this season, RFR number one. Yes, Phil there. I'm looking for Phil. (laughs) Almost got me, Phil. All right, David Fieldson says, uh, RFR number one, Venture said midichlorians this episode. Yes, we, yeah, we know. We got it. We got yeah. that. Jim, the number of emails that we are going to get, because people <laughs> don't wait for the episode to finish. I know. They, I know. they, they fire it off first. Yeah. I mean, even the, the puck gets by the greatest Hall of Famer goalies from time to times. So. <laughs> but yeah, it did. It did. It went right by me. Wow. She sure did say midi chlorian and there was no reaction, no revelation to the statement. No, nothing. I, I find that kind of odd. Yeah. Curious. Steel driver says somehow Asajj has returned. I'm sure the explanation will come in a novel. Maybe Kira will be involved. Oh God! Please, <laughs> no. Um, I'll tell you what, though they they were specific. Uh, Jennifer Corbett said in StarWars.com that the explanation will be revealed in future content. So mm-hmm. that doesn't even mean you know it could be a book with that mm-hmm. sort of shady. Uh, oh God! What if it's the even worse, Jim? What if it's a web comic? Oh my god. I mean that's that really is that's you're now you're <laughs> scraping the bottom, the bottom of the barrel, of yeah. <laughs> that's as low as it gets. A web Nothing comic. against look, there have been a lot of talented people working on those. I'm just talking about the hierarchy of of yeah. uh of of of, <laughs> of content. I wouldn't want to be around Nika Footerman when that news <laughs> breaks. Oh, um, all right, before we get to our calls, let's talk about uh the second test. 
The second test, which was more successful, uh, was when Ventress asked Omega to go up into the uh, colonnade and bring the white blossom down before the sun sets from the weeping Maya tree. And she succeeds. And Jim, as you were talking about earlier, she uh, gets her beast of burden in the form of Batcher, and she rides him up up the hill. And I thought, well, is that is is that cheating? Is that is that really what Ventress had in mind? And I'm like, well, wait a minute. This isn't. There are no rules to this stuff. It was just to show her skill, her instincts, her 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 problem solving abilities, all that stuff. So and and she passed this one. So yeah. she's now one for two. It's, you know, it's it's a test of drive, determination, uh, and and yeah, maybe uh, the force. You know, we know the force works in mysterious ways, and and Omega was successful. So, um, you know, y- y- she it's she a dub. failed. It's a dub, time. but is it is it a dub that makes you feel that? This is a result of high midichlorian count. No, no, I, I it's a, a fast lurka hound. I think really <laughs> right is what comes into play here. But is her ability to work with Batcher is that the result, or is that from a high midichlorian count? Well, in the third test, communicating with nature comes into play. It so. does. You know, she she may have passed the second test and the third test at the same time. That's what I. That's exactly what I was wondering. Um, but nonetheless, there's a win on the second test, and when she gets back, of course, Ventress is already <laughs> the, the, the batch have already in, in, been involved in a big scuffle with Ventress, and she really kind of kicks all their asses, uh, to be honest. And uh, I was excited because, Jim, we were wondering, what happened to Hunter's Blade? We got Hunter's Blade this Hunter's episode. Hunter's Blade returns. <laughs> yeah. Hunter Blade, his his blade returns. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, did he lose it? What? It was almost like he had a religious relationship with the blade when we were first introduced to the character. Kind of like Rambo in his survival knife. But uh, as the seasons have worn on, we haven't seen much of hunter pulling that blade out it's it's a little uh, feature in the hunter three and three quarter inch action figure where you can mm. unsheath the blade there and uh i i know as a kid i would have lost that blade within three minutes of playing with it but it's pretty cool i have to say this though massage ventress fond of punching below the belts during the fight <laughs> with hunter and record i slowed it down and counted 11 illegal Whoa. blows. Whoa. Where's the referee? We need someone to step in here and separate the two fighters, and Asaj should have been given at least a warning. And it should have affected the judges' scorecards, too. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Boy, that, you know, that's really low, especially, you know, for a, for a woman. Come on. It's better than that. Come on, <laughs> well, ladies. I mean, you, know. you shouldn't need to stoop to such levels. Come on. Well, yeah, hey, I say take advantage of any weakness from your opponent. So, um, her, her fighting style did remind me, for you Bond fans, of uh, Mayday and Xena on the top. From, uh, oh. Mayday from A View to a Kill and Xena from Goldeneye. Yeah, I, I, I got those vibes. Um, something I noticed, and I'll, I'll just say, we got a lot of heat after last week's episode with us complaining about the darkness. And I was very happy with this week's show. I didn't have any problems. All of the training with, uh, with, with Omega took place in daylight. Uh, I was able to see everything. Uh, even this scuffle between the Batch and Asajj, they were, they were in that cave, but I could still see everything. And there almost seemed, I don't know, it wasn't slow motion, but the, the fight was... It was it was almost like slower than normal so that I could absorb and kind of register the various moves and the blows. It felt I don't want to say it was slow as a bad thing. I mean, it was I just followed the fight really, really easily in this particular scuffle. So I was I was really glad it wasn't just like over in shadows like that last week's episode with that 
with that bounty of of Phoenix, the, the the praying mantis they were after. I didn't see a li- I didn't see a, a frame of that fight. I really didn't. So yeah, yeah, it was easier to make out. It was so fast paced. So it was like a forty second round of nonstop blows uh, being thrown. A lot of them below the belt. Yes, I was paying attention, <laughs> but I mean, it was you know I had to slow it down. And I'm a fight fan, you know. I watch I watch boxing. I'm I'm there for uh, Showtime on Saturdays, you know. But um, it 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 was very well choreographed, though. The the animators really uh, took their time to uh, make sure the moves made sense. And um, and obviously, Ventress had the upper hand, being a you know someone who can tap into the force. No she's question. Going, she's going to kick their the, their asses, you know. But. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was interesting that that whole fight. I thought it was getting like, a lot of feedback there goes that the... boot right to the crotch again <laughs> and again and now again. I gotta, go, I gotta again. Go, I, now we got to go back and watch it because I got to go back and see all the shots to the crotch. But no, we were definitely getting uh, a lot of comments in the chat saying it was one of the best fights uh, in Bad Batch, and everything was. Yes. Um, there's some are saying, "Wow, it looked like motion capture. It was it was so good." Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it was, but it was it was right. very well animated and choreographed. So uh, she she succeeds in the test, but this is big, big, big foreshadowing right here. We know she's a harbinger. Um, oh, someone in the chat said, "Well, was that second exercise really a test, or was it a diversion?" I think it was both. She yeah. it was a test, but then she utilized Omega's absence to have a heart to heart with the batch. And she says, now that she's gone, let me just give you some advice. Whatever you're planning, it kind of reminds me of Luke. This isn't going to end the way you think. Whatever you're planning on doing, it won't end well for you. Think carefully. How do you want this to go? Um, But here's a thought that occurred to me. Will Ventress join the batch? Like, is she, you know, like, is she been kicked in the teeth and beat up and and abandoned by so many in the past. But she sees this really motley crew in their first, their, 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 the first value uh, it, it, amongst them is loyalty. And I, I, I just wonder when, when she said that, you know, whatever you're planning, it's not going to go well. I'm telling you, I just felt like it was foreshadowing that we know it's foreshadowing, but will she join them? Could you see a day? I thought she fit in real well. Like the shots when she was in there with the batch, it's like I could see her being one of these guys. Yeah, you know, I mean, she's a character that defines definition. Mm-hmm. She's definitely an outcast. Yeah, I could see her fitting in with the guys, and she would be a great like mother figure for uh, for Omega compared to Hunter's fatherly figure. And uh, it's it, there's potential there with what you're saying. I the see her hooking thing... up with crosshair. I think those two are made for each oh, other. Oh, you, you picked up on some tension <laughs> yeah. there? A little sexual tension between the two? I don't know. I mean, you know. What, uh, what kind of interaction did they have? I, uh, crosshair accused her of being a liar. Yeah, yeah. No, it was definitely, no. There was nothing on screen that led me to believe. I just thought, well, they, you know, given their pasts, you know, they would really understand each other. I think they're they're both sort of always teetering teetering on the edge of, um, evil or bad. How would you like to be side? in the restaurant at the table next to those two when they're out for a romantic dinner? Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, he sounds all slimy. She's all like... <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a snake and a panther or something uh, <laughs> talking to each other. Um, I think we should... Look, we're, a, we're an hour deep in here and we've got I mean, the, the switchboard is jammed. So let's take some calls. We still have some more super chats to get through, but great episode. I mean, we're we're an hour deep. We haven't covered the whole thing. We'll still talk about test number three in the end. But let's go to uh, let's start with Matt in L.A. He's a Patreon member, which we love and appreciate, and he's been waiting. Uh, Matt, you're on with Rebel Force Radio. Hello. Hey, fellas, what's going on? Hey, hey. hi, Matt. Hey guys, I just wanted to kind of talk about this episode and say how great it was to have Asaz back on the screen. Nick is just killing it with the voice acting. What I think I liked about this version of Asaz that we see here is there's 
definitely been some growth that's happened off screen that they are showing and not telling. Um, I just loved her uh, ability to connect with the creatures around her. I think that was one of the biggest moments for me that showed, okay, she's had this, this moment where she understands the force a little better now, seeing the light and the dark. And uh, I'm just excited for her future. I'm excited to see where this goes. I think you guys are spot on. I think we're going to see a Tales of the Jedi short story with her. Potentially, I would love to see maybe an Ahsoka team up again, young uh, post-Clone Wars Ahsoka, figuring out the rebellion, maybe, uh, you know, setting the, the path for, you know, force users to find solace in this uh, empire taking over and looking for M counts. And then possibly, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but maybe a final Vader showdown, a sacrifice, you know, to save mm. the potential future force wielders. I just, you know, I'm excited to see her. I like the little callback to that. She has multiple lives like all night sisters do. Uh, I'm very excited and I'm very happy with this. Episode. You know, when you, when you mentioned Vader, uh, what comes to mind is there would be something kind of satisfying about Asajj calling Vader out as Anakin Skywalker because Ooh. it's without oh, yeah. all of the sentimentality that Obi-Wan and Ahsoka, who have called him out as Anakin, they have. They, they, there's, there's a sentimentality. Asajj has no sentimentality at all. So I could see her really... Uh, as the kids call it, dead naming Anakin Skywalker, uh, uh, Darth Vader. So, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Somebody liked Someone it liked it over in Matt's house there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that would present some think- awesome uh, drama, I think. It would be, uh, and, and of course, Vader would 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 walk away the victor. Oh, no absolutely. Question about yeah, it. right. But right. Asajj could give him a good fight. And uh, I would love it if, if if her story went in that direction. But here we are waiting for future content to learn how she survived the uh, events of Dark Disciples. So uh, right. we, uh, we, should, we shouldn't be holding our breath for anything like that. I, they're going to drag it out as long as they have to. But that presents an awesome storytelling opportunity, in my opinion. Yeah, I love it. You know, Matt, there's, you know, it's sort of, the obvious thing to say, oh, they should face Vader. They should face Vader. And some of them I kind of roll my eyes, but this one I like a lot. Ventress v. Vader. I'm there for it. Good idea. Yeah, thanks, guys. I I'm, I think there's definitely an opportunity there. Doing it subtly, doing it in a way that isn't like, you know, just bringing Vader back for any opportunity. I, I think you're on to it. Yeah, oh, and Jeff Holland reminding us in the chat, yeah, Ventress gave him the scar. True. So they, he's got a score to settle. There's history there. There's, there there's is a history there. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Hey, Matt, thanks so much for calling. Appreciate it. And thank you for being a Patreon supporter. Please, thanks, uh, yeah, please call us again. It would be Jason, great. Jason, I'm going to have to, I got to step away for a quick second. So uh, if you want to jump into yeah. the next call, I'll be, yep. I'll be back in like one minute. One minute. No, Sorry. No, no problem. It's all right. All right. Well, let's go to, uh, I got to find an easy one. I gotta find. I can't. I gotta find, and I can't. I can't do Blake because Max got to be here for Blake. So let's go and uh, let's talk to uh, Tony. No, sorry, Brian from Tennessee. Brian, we're 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 skipping everybody else, and we're going right to you. Take it easy on me. I don't have Mac here. Hope you don't want a refund on your phone call. He had to step away. Yeah, I get I get fifty percent of the. Uh... The podcast, right? Hey, thanks, Jason. <laughs> yeah, up. man. Um, listen, I you know, we, this has probably been beat to death, but I, my my worlds are colliding. I'm about six hours in listening to um, uh, the Asajj um, Ventress book, The Dark Disciple. Mm-hmm. I'm about ten hours into the Secret History of Star Wars, which got the, and the only reason I'm reading that is because. Jimmy on the Q and A a couple Q and A's ago, maybe even the last one, he and the guy that were talking, um, you know, mentioned it was a Yoda questionnaire just for Jimmy, I think. And and one and one of the questions was, what Star Wars, um, what thing that's not a figurine would you would you would you 
keep, you know, would you take it if there was a fire? I don't know if that was the exact question or not. Right, but, but right. But yeah. both of them said secret history. It's and a great so book. Here's my, here's it's it's a fantastic book. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's, it's phenomenal. And Tyler even said, y'all did a, a thing with the narrator, a uh, podcast with the narrator. I'm going to go back and listen to it. But here's, but here's where our worlds are colliding. I was driving today for work and listening to the book, and they're talking about Return of the Jedi. And they, they were talking about how George painted himself into a, into a corner. And because of what they said in Empire, there's an, Yoda said there's another. Um, mm-hmm. They had to come up with another. And it just, it just so happened it was Leia. Um, that's how it worked out. That was the easiest thing for George to write. So it was Leia. But in, in the dialogue, Luke says, my father has it, talking about the Force. My father has it, I have it, and you have it. Um, I know that, that, that Dave Filoni has now said that everybody has the Force within them or Metacorians within them in the, in, or M count or whatever we want to call it these days. Mm-hmm. But, but why, are they, why are they even testing Omega? Number one, she's a clone. And, and I'm not a scientist, but I would think that a clone is, is a clone. So if they're cloning Django, and y'all have, y'all have actually touched on this a, a bit, but if they're cloning Django, he wasn't force sensitive. Why are they why are they testing him? Right. Number one, and then and then and then going back to this book and going back to the original trilogy, I was six when I first saw Star Wars uh, Episode Four. Um, and and going back to the original trilogy, it's, it it seems like you had to have it. You either had it or you didn't. Vader had it. Luke had it. His sister had it. Um, and now we're getting into everybody's got it. So it, all my worlds are colliding with this with this episode with the Omega, with the <laughs> book that I'm reading, Dark Disciple, and then with with Secret Subs. But anyway, your thoughts? Uh, I'm really torn about this because uh, I I can see both ways. I mean, I, as somebody who grew up. Um, and seeing Return of the Jedi as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, and eight-year-old on the subsequent releases, and then watching the original films on HBO and video cassette and all of that, I just believed with all my heart that I, if I trained hard enough, could be a Jedi. It, 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 there was nothing in the yeah. original trilogy that made me think, and some of that's just childhood innocence, but there was nothing in the trilogy, the original trilogy, sure. that made me think that it was exclusive. I certainly understood that Luke was really, really strong in the Force. They use that a lot in the original trilogy. Uh, you've been taught well. You're this Force they is did. strong with you. I mean, the reason he had such a target on his That's back right. with Palpatine, going back to just what we knew as kids in the 70s and 80s, was that uh, he sensed that Luke was so strong in the Force that he he wanted he wanted right. Va- he wanted Luke to replace to replace Vader. So. I the, both things existed at the same time for me. You can have superstars, rock stars, and you can have um, even little Jason from Canton, Ohio, can grow up to be a Jedi someday. What's surprising here, and I'll just yeah. cover Omega, and I'll give my prediction, and I'll let Mac Mac take this too. Um, I predict that Omega is not force sensitive. That's my prediction. I don't think they're going there. I don't think that this that this final series, yeah. this this last season with just a few episodes to go, I don't think it's the goal of these writers to create a fa- a, another story of a Jedi in training. I think there's something different yeah. here. Not necessarily bigger or better, but I think there's something different here. So I don't, Mac, um, our caller was inspired by the Q&A where you were talking about the secret history of Star Wars and what a treasure trove that is. And um, But he was seeing how, but now everybody, Every George Lucas painted himself in a corner with Jedi, and now he's seeing that same thing happen in uh, in Star Wars here, where everybody's a Jedi, everybody's force sensitive. Well, everybody. I mean, that's kind of a stretch, you know. I'm still holding my breath, waiting for Kidster to be force sensitive, and it's not going to ever happen. <laughs> so, see, th- there are exceptions, um, but everyone is connected to the force in its own way. You know, it's like, okay. I, yeah. that's what I think. Like, you know, life creates it. Um, it's, it's all about the, the, the giant energy of, of all humanity, but, and all yeah. humanity and nature, you know, the force is everywhere. 
Even Yoda even says it. The Rock. So going back, the Rock. Look at that Rock. Yeah. And then leave it to the and High go, Republic to turn a Rock into a book. character. <laughs> What's that? What's that? Is go this ahead, Jeremy? Right. This is Brian. Brian, I'm sorry. No, this Jeremy. is Brian. Okay, Jeremy. So what's your? <laughs> I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> Jimmy Max having yeah. a Larry King moment here. <laughs> Hello. We're here with Jeremy. Hello. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, you're, you're absolutely right. And going back to this book, it's just, I mean, it's kind of changed my, my life, of my Star Wars life, the secrets of, of Star Wars um, this book has. And, uh, but, but going back to the early renditions that, that George was, was writing, saying, okay, when things die, it, it makes you more powerful in the force. So I understand that. I think one of the things that made me as a six-year-old when I first saw the original Star Wars um, made Luke so um, Luke was the fact that I didn't have the force. Jason was just talking, you know, he, he wanted to, he wanted to think that he had the force. And, and I tr I've tried to make a salt shaker move. I've tried to, <laughs> you know, make the wind move, but, but it's just not working. And, the thing that made Luke Luke and, and Obi Wan Obi Wan and Darth Darth was that they had the Force, and now Dave's going back and, and maybe re rearranging that. But but he says it, it, it's with George George's blessing. So um, you know, my question was, I don't know if you heard it, was all these things are intertwining. Um, Omega getting tested. I'm reading Dark Disciple. I'm about six hours into that. I'm ten hours into the secrets and so all my worlds are colliding right now but but <laughs> that one thing i read today or listened to today was the i'm i've got it my dad had it you've got it meaning not everybody has it why didn't you say that to Han? why didn't you say it to chewy y'all got it too guys <laughs> all right well here's the thing <laughs> here's the thing no one has the force you don't have the force okay you can connect to the force and you can work with the force. You can learn how to manipulate the force to do all those tricks. Yeah. But no one has it. No one, like, owns it. That's what I've always believed. No one owns the force. Okay. But you have various degrees of being able to communicate with it and connect with it. Palpatine... Even yeah. though Palpatine in the prequels, he, he's surrounded by force users, the Jedi Council. He's having meetings with them and and they're involved in politics and stuff. So to be around a force user is nothing unusual for Palpatine. The Jedi can't pick up on Palpatine's connection to the force because he's using the dark side. But when Palpatine comes yeah. into contact with Anakin, he almost seems to get drunk off of the fact that Anakin yeah. is so connected to the Force. The Force runs strong with you. Oh, he's like getting high off of it. It's so intense. It's almost perverse. Yeah. But it doesn't mean like yeah. the yeah. like Anakin yeah. is containing the Force. Anakin is containing the ability to connect with the Force in a stronger, more profound way than almost anybody else in the history of Force users yeah. uh, existing. But he doesn't. He doesn't like have the force. And I've heard that, yeah, the force, I, I'm, you know, strong. They're always like strong with the force, but it doesn't mean they like, they contain the force. They connect with the force. And I think that's a healthy way of looking at it. How well can you connect with the force? And there's even, you know, a way to, to ch check your, your physical self to, to see how strongly you have that potential if they measure the midi chlorians yeah. within your bloodstream. So that's yeah. just a way of, of defining how people can be connecting to the force on various levels. But I don't think anybody has the force, just the ability. Some have a stronger ability to do it. And the way it's explained physically is by measuring the M count in someone's blood. Now, back to Omega. Is she strong with the force? Does she have a high midichlorian count? Still, you know, TBD, but I tend to agree with Asajj Ventress. She's a little sketchy at the end of this episode when 
Cross here accuses her of lying about Omega's M count. But Asajj plays it coy. And, you know, like I said, Cross here calls her out, says she's a liar. But then she lays the truth on them they might not want to hear. And she says if Omega did have that potential, she'd have to be trained. And if they're going to train her, they're going to remove her from the bad badge. What they want is irrelevant. Um, you know, that's a, yeah. that's a truth right there. I don't think the Bad Batch want to deal with. So is Asajj telling the truth or is she lying? I think, I personally think she's telling the truth. I don't think Omega ne necessarily has the high M count, but she has something about her blood. There's something about her blood that can withstand the injection of M high midichlorian infusion of blood right that's what i feel is is is, is missing I, I i and i and i fall prey to it too because sometimes the show is is allowing me to sort of conflate the two which is a high m count versus like jim said blood that is able to clone blood not just blood cloned yeah. blood that is able to withstand the infusion of high midichlorian blood um i think they're two totally i think they're two totally different things and the, the the reason that omega didn't i think excel at these tests and i think one number two on a technicality is because she's not going to end up force sensitive they're going to find out something even more evil is at play here Ooh, evil specifically. Well, she was created by the Kaminoans. So if they were up to an evil plot, I don't know what it is. But maybe they were trying to develop their own army of Force-sensitive clones. And Omega was the first step in that direction. Yeah. They couldn't necessarily clone a connection to the Force, but you can take a donation of, of blood from a Force-sensitive inject it into a clone and create a force sensitive clone. They've been trying to do this over and over and over again, even in the future of the star Wars chronology, they're trying to do it with Snoke. Mm -hmm. And it's just like it. Why does he look the way he looks? I've heard, I've heard, explanations that he looks that way because he had a duel with luke skywalker but that's never really landed in canon i think he looks the way he looks is because yeah. that's what happens that's as close as cloning technology has gotten to creating a force sensitive clone it was snoke and it what happened it ate away at him physically right. that's that's my head canon as well yeah that's my head canon as well um it's a great thought yeah brian great conversation great call love it thank you so much and thanks for being a patreon vip that's great and i'm sure we'll talk to hey, you thanks guys i, I appreciate what y'all do uh, oh, dude. all the time I'm, I'm hoping maybe to get up on the four on may the fourth but i don't know if i can get up there so if i can i'd love to meet y'all but uh but i appreciate what y'all do every every week well it's great we appreciate you too thanks so much thank you thank all you all right uh jim I, I i got hate to do this but we've we've only got Three minutes until bedtime. Bedtime for Blake, so we got to do it. It's time for Blake's Take. It's time for Blake's Take. All right, Blake's Take. I hope that uh, Mom and Dad are letting him stay up. Blake, we we rolled out the red carpet. We got a special jingle just for you. We have not. We haven't done that, I don't think. We don't even do that for F.J. DeSanto because it would be riddled with profanity. <laughs> Um, so we can't have an <laughs> FJ jingle, but anyway, uh, I hope that you can, I thought you'd be on spring break. You're not on spring break. Uh, we, last week we were on spring break. Oh, last week. And My kids are on spring break, break this week. All right. So it's a school night for you, right? Um, yeah, but tomorrow <sighs> I don't have baseball practice, so oh. it's all right. Oh, it's all right. Okay, well, let's get right to it. What do you got for us this week? Um, so, first of all, I want to talk about whenever I was watching this, I, I got just came back from baseball practice. Didn't I, I made sure I didn't see any spoilers anywhere or anything. Mm -hmm. I wanted to watch Bad Batch. 
and I I was I told my dad drive 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 I want to go watch Bad Batch. <laughs> then we came home we watched Bad Batch, and we make it around to the beginning whenever she makes it into the cave area, mm-hmm. and then I said as a joke, imagine if Asajj Ventures is in there, and she just turns on her lightsaber or something, just scares Omega. And then the next thing I know, Asajj Ventures comes out of the shadows. There it right is. Right behind Omega. And I was Bada like, bing. I just said that as a joke. I didn't even mean to predict that. <laughs> Your instincts are so fine-tuned to everything that's happening in the Bad Batch and Star Wars in general, Blake. I don't know why they don't invite you into the writer's room and start <laughs> picking your little mind for awesome ideas to carry Star Wars into the future. Help us, Blake. You're our only hope. <laughs> I'd love to write for Star Wars, man. That'd be fun. Hey, hey you never know. To and I'm going to keep Wars. encouraging you to keep writing, and we'll see. Uh, maybe just a few years away, we'll be, uh, we'll be calling you for uh, visits to Skywalker Ranch. Yeah. Yeah, maybe so we're here to see Blake. I'll pull up to the thing, uh, to the gate. I'm here to see Blake. Please pull right forward, sir. I remember pulling up and saying, we're here to see Dave Filoni. Now, that next we'll be pulling up and saying, we're here to see Blake. That's right. <laughs> so what do you got for us this week, Blake? You, you were able to figure out it was a Saj in that cave. Uh, what, what sort of... Uh, uh, thoughts do you have regarding this episode of Bad Batch, The Harbinger? Um, I think this episode was really good. Like, it was phenomenal. And just like how Jason was talking about earlier, some it, it did feel like it was, like, in certain parts, it was, like, kind of slow. Definitely wasn't slow motion, like you said. But it, like, it just let you, like, see everything that was happening in the fight. Yeah. It'd be part where she's fighting, and then just and then it sh- it'd just be a little bit slower than whenever she's kicking in other times. And it was just like some parts would be super fast, and then other parts would slow down a little bit. And it's kind of like it was like trying to just get in between, but it was it was cool to watch. Good pacing. Yeah. And all three of them, I, um, I got this but- photo of it. I was just going to say, all three of them had a chance to draw their weapons and point them at her. Uh, finally, towards the end of that so of that fight, it's like how many how many bad batch does it take to take down one Asajj Ventress? Well, all of them. Well, they didn't even get a beater. No, they, they didn't. Were, Re- Re- Wrecker was held up in a force choke. Hunter was down on the ground while Asajj had her lightsaber. And Crosshair was laying on the ground. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't, re- they didn't really get the beat. Yeah, this is some image here. And, and here's poor Omega. She's like, I brought you a flower. <laughs> <laughs> she said her brothers you know, get the crap picked out of them. <laughs> right. Oh, my God. Yeah, Crosshair's unconscious. <laughs> Hunter's suspended in a force choke, and there's a blade at Hunter's throat. It's... <laughs> And, and, and then she was just like, all right, just give her one more chance. One right, more I know. Chance. I'll see what happens to that. I'll bet. That is true, Blake. That's so funny. She kicks the crap out of them, and she comes, and she's like, oh, I think you guys are being a little hard on her, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Omega. But you know what, though? I just I, I, I love the character. And she should be. Oh, there was a line here, uh, real quick, Blake. There was a line that I just loved I wanted to throw out, which is uh, when they're on the boat and Ventress says uh, something about her smiling. She's like, stop smiling. It's uh, it's unsettling. Unsettling, <laughs> And yes. I just, I like that they sort of break the fourth wall a little bit there on Omega because she is so good. She is so sweet. She is so pure. But as we've talked <laughs> about, she's earned everything along the way, in in my opinion, in our mm-hmm. opinion. Um but I like that they're not above just kind of, you know, opening a, again, opening the 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 fourth wall, and um, just kind of yeah, a little dig at Omega, yeah, like, yeah, oh, you're so great. you're so pure, it's sick. Stop smiling. <laughs> yeah, goody two shoes, right? 
Yeah, that was funny. I also like uh, uh, like Wrecker's line whenever he says, "How does she know we're looking at her?" I, oh. I found that. <laughs> I like that too. Yeah, I like that too. I love it because it was the moment when uh, uh, they they had told Omega they wouldn't interfere in her in her testing. And where are they? They got the yeah. micro binoculars. They're across the street <laughs> checking everything out. Yeah, <laughs> they get the helicopter, helicopter parents. Right, exactly. Funny. Funny stuff. Uh, all right, but is there anything else before we uh, let you go? And we uh, next week we got a double feature. We got a double batch. Yeah, uh, I have one more thing I want to talk about. So no one really knows. So they, they said they're going to tell us how Asajj came back because apparently she died from Dooku. Yeah, um, yeah. earlier Adam, in the show, Jim. Yeah. yeah, Jim gave us a whole prologue uh, from the uh, dark disciple book all right um i wasn't here for that i'm driving home <laughs> yeah, that's so all right. <laughs> i joined in watch batch and then i was i was just excited yeah yes. um, but I, wanna, I think i have a theory on how she came back okay like the whole reason why thrawn is back is from the night sisters I mm-hmm. think that's how she's back. Yes, well, the night sisters uh, revived her back. It's it's alluded to. It's, it's alluded to a little bit in the book. Uh, Jim was telling about how they sort of layer in the in the water, right? Yes, um, and that's sort of a. But in the book, is it more about like a ceremonial burial in a sense? Like that's the. Well, yes, of course. You know, it's just Obi Wan and Qu- Quinlan Vos, and they're burying her. In, you know, I mean, they're putting her to rest in the water, and it's just the way that they describe it—the black water that just, you know, her face was the last thing you saw before she fully submerged, and mm-hmm. once she went under, the green vapor started to rise up out of the water and you could hear the whispers of night sisters in the air. I mean, that to me sounds like a resurrection, much like Ahsoka was resurrected in a very similar way in episode five of the Ahsoka series when she was in the world between worlds and having that encounter with Anakin. The last thing we saw was her sink into that oily black water. The last thing that submerged was her face. And the next thing you know, she was resurrected. So I see kind of a similar beat going on here with the end of Dark Disciple. What do you think about that, Blake? Um, yeah, that like those things are definitely connected. So definitely. Uh, Going in the water and then coming out like the whole water. I, yeah. <laughs> All right, buddy. I think that'll do it. Um, we'll talk to you next week. Okay, double batch, and we'll play yes. your jingle again. All right. Play it one more time, so, j- so right. Blake yeah, can hear wanted- it. You want to hear it, Blake? Here we go. You yeah. ready? Here it is. It's time for Blake's take. You got your own intro. Yeah, see, like, even FJ don't got that. Because if it was <laughs> just like how you said, it'd just be bleep, 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 bleep. bleep. <laughs> yeah, it would be. Uh, oh, you should have heard him last week. My goodness. What a f- That's what it yeah. would be. It would be this. That's the FJ intro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be his intro. <laughs> That's right. The, All the right, man. Hey. What do you call him? The potty mouth? The... Uh... The, 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 the potty mouth, the potty mouth prophet. The potty yeah. mouth prophet. Yeah, you know, sure. FJ has that profit or loser intro, but that's not a, a, a celebratory jingle. To, yeah, to that's a game. That's a game we play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we got you a jingle. Hey, I want to thank RFR. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, Puppet Lando's producer Jeff Ulysny for putting that together. Jeff is a, a great guy and a, a, a musical talent in his own right. And he uh, works with Puppet Lando. So he's kind of a saint in a certain way. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he, he produces all of Puppet Lando's music. And I think there's another track on the way 
that we should be really? getting before May the 4th. Um, yeah, Something's about yeah, to drop? Listen. You know, yeah, that's, that's, that's what the pop stars yeah. say. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah. something about to drop next week. Yeah, uh, Billy Mack has been in contact with Puppet Lando, uh, you know, like 24-7. Well, here's and, the uh, weird he, thing about Puppet is that you can't get anywhere near him without going through Billy Mack. Yeah. Those yeah. two are so yeah. so attached at the hip. I know. It's like Bill Bixby in The Incredible Hulk. Right. And, uh, <laughs> He's a gatekeeper to yeah. Puppet. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, they, they've tipped me off that there's something on the way, but... Uh, I just want to thank Jake for putting together that jingle. One more time, Swank. One more time. It's time for Blake's Take. All right. Nice. Well, we thank Blake. Uh, get to bed, kid. Get to bed. All right. Let's. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, ooh, Mariana. Super chat for Mariana says, uh, we love Mariana. She says, hey, FR, RFR, thanks for a great show as always. I'm super happy to have announced that I'm launching my own podcast. Good for you. You guys have been a massive inspiration for me to do so. Keep up the great work. Well, let us know what your podcast is, uh, Mariana. We'll we'll give it a little plug here. We were just talking before the show about man, it's a it is a crowded crowded field in the podcast world, but it is a very rewarding and fun way to express yourself. And uh, if you're fortunate enough, and I say fortunate, blessed to have an audience, find an audience. It's uh, it's all the better. So. Good luck to you. Uh, Jim, here's somebody you know calling right now. We've got Patreon VIP Suds from Chicago. Oh, one of the Suds. Babu Freaks, I believe, here. Awesome. Uh, giving us a call. So, uh, Suds, welcome to the show. Chuck, Chuck, gentlemen. How are you doing this fine evening? Wow. Just Suds great. making his after show debut. This is something. Uh, this has Ooh. been a, a long. What, what do they say? Uh, what does Tarkin say right before uh, he thinks this will he's going to be a day long remembered? Yes, long remembered. Long remembered. Suds calling into the after show. Yes. Well, it's great to hear from you, Suds. What do you got? Before, uh, well, before I uh, get to the point of my call, I'd like to announce that I'm starting a new uh, online campaign uh, hashtag bring back the beard. Uh, oh, Tyler. Oh, oh no. look at him. <laughs> look at that little baby face. I yeah, love it. Yeah. it. Looks like a <laughs> shaved baby squirrel on his chin. It's like in, it's like in SpongeBob when they shave Sandy in the tree. <laughs> or have you ever seen those um those 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 pictures of uh, what Chewbacca would look like if he had no hair? <laughs> oh god. <laughs> <laughs> that is the stuff of nightmares those hairless please i'm i'm warning you don't google that it is you know, it'll keep you up for yeah. for, for days <laughs> the hairless chewbacca tyler you're much better that you're much better looking than that out absolutely oh. i i i i would i would agree with that I just it was it was quite a shock. The, quite the shock when <laughs> you know it's it's, you know, it's almost as if uh, he's, you know, got rid of his uh, his superpower, but uh, he's Samson without that's... without the hair. But exactly, no, like I Max know, said, you know what? Great. I, I, I think, think he if looks he just great. really concentrates and grunts that hair, you'll just see it literally just start to grow. I think he can do it on command. That's how manly he is. <laughs> yeah, he looks great. Bring him up for the final thoughts, and it's all the way back. <laughs> All right, Suds, did you just call in to break balls or do you have something to say about this episode? No, 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 no. No, even though I was, I really like seeing Ventress in this episode, uh, even though we all knew it was coming because she was in the trailer, the way they kind of introduced her in the episode, like uh, Blake said, when she came out of the shadows, even though I knew it was coming, I still did one, did like a, <gasps> You know that that it was her. I really liked seeing the interactions between uh, her and Omega, especially uh, the training, and it kind of led me to think that I want to throw this possibility out to you that um, future content. How about an Asajj Ventress Omega spinoff show where? Asajj is, mm. is training Omega to access and, and utilize the Force. 
they get a we need something show. else though you know to hmm. to accompany that story there has to be some big galactic conflict yeah. that they're involved in that ties them into the big picture story of the star wars saga it can't just be about gotcha. omega in a size but um that the element alone i think would make for a compelling bit of storytelling within like i said a, a bigger picture story yeah yeah the only the only as i'm as i'm talking about it the only issue i could potentially see with it is how do they it, it has to do with the the part of the timeline that this all happens in mm. how, how do they kind of crowbar that in without messing with the rest of the existing canon you know, I really don't think that Omega is force sensitive and can be trained at the end of the day. Um, I, I know that they, yeah. they're leaving it very open ended here, but uh, she did fail two of the three tests that Asaj were doing. percent uh, She got yeah. a 33% on the test. So, yeah. uh, as overall. crude as those tests were, <laughs> she doesn't really step up and, and, and like prove without a doubt. That because I was thinking to myself, oh, this is great. They're finally addressing the Omega Force sensitive sensitivity question we've had since season one. They're yep. finally addressing it, and I think that we saw, yeah, like Jason said, thirty percent. So that's a failure rate in whatever educational <laughs> institution you want to run through. 30% is not good, except for Major League Baseball. 30% but, is great but, as a batting average, but other than that. But, guys, think about this, though. If you're a Saj Ventress and you get contacted by Fennec Shan and it's the question about you got these 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 former clones, well, I guess they're current clones, but former uh, soldiers that are asking these questions about this kid and this M count, and you're a Saj, you're like, okay, I got to go see what's going on here. And then you you know that she's being hunted by the Empire, and you conclude that she does not have a high M count. Aren't your wheels going to be spinning? You're like, what's really at the heart of this? Why are they after this? So will she be the one potentially to connect the dots out of her own curiosity and her own appetite for revenge against Palpatine and the Sith? Will she be the one to connect the dots to say, no, this isn't about her being Force-sensitive or having a high M count. It's about her blood being capable of perhaps or her body being in, being capable of in, being inhabited by someone who is super uh high midichlorian count or something like that will she like be the palpatine. one to actually yeah like palpatine will she be the one to connect those dots will this continue to ruminate in her mind of all right i've tested the kid she's not high but yet she's top of the list of the empire why um, now, Moni G mm -hmm. is voicing what a lot of people have said and, and, and what the Bad Batch themselves believe, which is she's bluffing. I'm not convinced she's bluffing, but that's that's the part of the fun is all I'm the speculation. Either. Yeah. That's kind of the feeling that I got was that she's, she's bluffing. She was being awfully cagey mm -hmm. about uh, whether or not Omega has a high, I'm not going to say M count, midichlorian count, uh, or not. Oh, you purist. Just, she <laughs> was such a purist. She, I'm not going to say M was, count. She was be, she was That's be, Disney canon. I'm sticking with the Lucas stuff. I'm studs. <laughs> Listen to me roar. Matt, Max busted a little bit so of balls I, here I just, because he knows Suds real well. So for those of you that are new, uh, <laughs> they're like, boy, Mac is really taking it to this caller. <laughs> you too mean to me, Jason. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, you know. no. All right. Uh, Suds, it was good to hear from you, buddy. Are, are we going to see you on May 4th? All right. Great talking to you guys. You gonna make it? Uh, you know what? Unfortunately, <gasps> not. No, no, I can't. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, it's all right. Understood. All right, buddy. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. All right, we still um, love you. We do. We do love you. The, here's a call, uh, Alex. Also, we've got all Patreons. By the way, this is so great. Thank you all 
so much for being uh, Patreon supporters of us. Here's Alex from West Virginia. He wants to get on the Asajj Ventress talk, wants to get in on it. Hello, Alex. Alex. Hey, guys. Raise my Cerveza Crystals to you and uh, get into some conversation here. Cerveza Crystals. Some are suggesting that that is Jump the Shark already. Have we worn that out too much, Cerveza Crystal? It's only been a couple of weeks. My God, people are still making a it's a trap joke. Uh, Can't we have Cerveza Crystal for uh, maybe a month? We can have it for eternity. It'll never die. Yes, for eternity. I like the way you, I like the cut of your jib. So what do you think about this episode? I want to preface everything I'm about to say with the lens of I have adored the writing of this season of Bad Batch. They have largely earned everything that they do in the writing. But. This episode, (laughs) I question that to a degree because of Ventress's return. It's not that I don't want to see Ventress back, and I believe that it can be done effectively. I rode along with the Maul revival and the Palpatine revival, and while I would have liked explanations for these things, it's fiction. It can happen. So I, I can let that go. And the difference that I see between their revivals and that of Ventress is that no other character could have filled the role that Palpatine or Maul filled when they were brought back. There's no one else that could do it. Whereas Ventress, from what we see in the Bad Batch, looking at that in a vacuum, I don't see why another character could not have taken that role, whether it be Ahsoka or, as I have seen others suggest, Quinlan Voss, who has a definite Ventress connection. You could achieve a similar story as to what we saw in this episode. Well, I, I want to push back just a little bit on you, Alex, here, because I You're opened right. I, I opened the show by saying she was the perfect character to deliver ambiguity, half-truths that we sort of get in this episode. I would expect more clarity and decisive answers from a Quinlan Voss or an or an Ahsoka certainly from an Ahsoka Tano, so I I feel as though that she was perfect because the writers I'm hoping are putting some layers in here to where it's not so on the nose obvious. I will recant what I'm saying here if it turns out that everything is literal and Omega's force sensitive, Asajj is lying. If everything turns out to be a literal, uh a literal interpretation of the dialogue and the events that we're seeing, I will come back and I will say, you know what? Alex was right. It turns out uh, Ventress was just a roll of the dice. uh, And and it wasn't necessarily the, the, the perfect choice, but I still feel that she's such a sneaky, sneaky character that that's why she was put in here. So that, that that's my pushback on this. I could see that. Um, like you said, it, it's something that has to play out. We either have to see it in the themes or maybe she turns up again to reveal some nugget of truth that we've yet to see. Yeah. You know, you're right, though, when you say that uh, they could have easily brought back Darth Maul to fill this role. And mm-hmm. he actually has more of a purpose in this era than the previously thought dead as Aj Ventress does. What's the difference? I mean, they both serve similar purposes. I think it was just the the storyteller's desire to bring Asaj back because they, they see a lot of potential in the character. I yeah. mean Darth Maul has been kind of yeah. uh, and I, I I just don't use want Asaj to uh, embody a trope. Uh-huh. And you run into that danger with Darth Maul, and you have been ever since, I mean, you got the season seven of the Clone Wars with Darth Maul playing a heavy role in that. He's still around in the solo era, inexplicably, (laughs) but there he is. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and he's a criminal warlord or, or a, a gangster at the very least. 
Um, I think Asajj, she's more of a free agent at this point in time. Mm-hmm. She's she's serving a bounty on her role, so that explains her connection to Fennec Shand. And, you know, she's running in similar circles. Darth Maul doesn't run around with bounty hunters, for crying out loud. I mean, he hires them, sure, but he's more of a godfather type in this era of Star Wars. Yeah. So a it's kind of, kind of hard for him to lay low, I think, when he's running the Black Sun Syndicate. You know, Asajj <laughs> is a free agent. She she works for herself. She is an individual so I think it's easier to slot her in instead of someone like Maul. Perhaps, but the thing is, you still have to do the mental gymnastics uh, of storytelling to bring a dead character back to life. Yes. And again, they can write that off however they so desire, but they can only do it so many times before the audience identifies it as a trope that no one really dies. I look to something like Marvel where, you know, uh, Spider-Man's Uncle Ben, you know, he's that mm. one character that, you know, outside of alternate realities is always one that stays dead. So you got to have some uh, groundedness somewhere in this. I, and I don't know quite where that line has to be I drawn. get you, Alex. I, 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 I understand what you're saying. The trope of bringing back a dead character versus Asajj Ventress herself being a trope, something like that. Yeah, I think you're... I, I, I agree with you. I think that there that is a danger, though, if we're going to open up the action figure uh, collector's case and 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 pull the character out that fits the 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 necessary plot points here, I, I would have pulled that Asajj Ventress action figure out of the box. I really I really would have. Um, and that's somehow, you know, somehow sometimes that's how my brain works. I literally yeah. picture the Darth Vader the Darth Vader collector case and you know the, the the writers by the way if I was a Star Wars writer that's exactly I'd write all my shows that way I, I think <laughs> Spaloni still does operate from that sort of vibe you know where yeah you know if I was gonna open the toy box who would be in there and ready to roll for this story and you know, Dave does just that up in his head right right Alex, great call, man. Thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for being a Thank Patreon you. supporter. Uh, all the calls tonight have just been phenomenal, fantastic. You guys are just absolutely, truly, and we, we, we say it a lot, but we absolutely mean it, the best Star Wars fans out there, RFR listeners. Um, I just love that we can sit and we can talk Star Wars on the merits of the storytelling and the writing and the characters and the situations it's so refreshing in a in a, a polarized age where people are just, you know, uh, throwing all kinds of garbage into their conversations. This is just great Star Wars talk. And that's what we love to bring you here on Rebel Force Radio. Uh, huge, huge thanks to our call screener, Tyler Page. Beard or no beard, he's the best call screener uh, in the podcast biz, I believe. He's just absolutely the best. Uh, Tyler, a lot of fantastic calls we didn't get to all of them this week but um anything in particular that we left unspoken un un uh unmentioned unresolved uh, yeah i think there's a couple of things one caller Whoa, brought really? up Wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, tell us, Mr. Co-host. What did, <laughs> what did we okay. get to? <laughs> Listen, you, can, you guys only have so much time. And there's so much content fit in this little 27-minute episode. Okay? Right. You know, you guys could keep going for hours, I'm sure. But, uh, but yeah, we had one caller uh, point out that they recreated a Bruce Lee uh, scene uh, beat for beat. Uh, oh, really? From Way of the Dragon when uh, wow. Asajj was doing her uh, hand-to-hand combat. Oh, yeah. Um, Damien here was going to talk about that. Sorry, Damien. Ooh. We're going to yeah, have to was... do side-by-side comparisons of this. That's a good That's call. That's amazing. We got to get Mark Koo, uh, on. He's a Bruce Lee expert. <laughs> Our, yeah. the, the RFR's Jedi Master Yogi, we got to get him on. He can talk about that. He is a Bruce Lee expert, but that's really... That's really interesting that people were picking up on that. That's where they took the choreography for that great fight scene. Mm. It's from Way of the Dragon? Wow. That's yeah, amazing. Cool. Yeah, I know so what I'm good. doing when this show is over. <laughs> <laughs> 
good little pickup. And then uh, I thought of, uh, you know, when she tells Omega to go climb that mountain and get the flower, I couldn't help but think of uh, the Edelweiss flower from uh, German military history where the German, the Nazis would have to, you know, their strongest warriors would climb the mountain and pick the flower and then wow. they'd wear it as a badge of honor. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I thought that, you that know, was I thought Tyler band- was going to throw down a Sound of Music reference and he went into... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's in there too, but, you know. <laughs> Great Christopher Plummer uh, there, uh, Jimmy Mac. Thank uh, you. Wow, that th- th- those are good things, and I, I regret that we didn't get to them. We, you know, it's it's so interesting the way these after shows go. Sometimes there's episodes that, uh, you know, people are just like, ah, hey, you know, and they're just kind of casual about it, and then there's an episode like this where. Man, everybody was just coming up with great thoughts, great theories, great observations, great calls. Uh, we could have probably gone an, another hour, but we've got more Rebel Force Radio coming at you later this week with the weekly show. Uh, but Tyler, as always, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks beard or no guys. beard? We're, Is that we, everything? We love you. Oh, yeah, did we mi- uh, that's it for me. Okay, yeah. all right. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> I just want to make sure you're going out on Edelweiss. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> all right tyler thanks buddy appreciate it thanks uh jimmy mac wow oh you know what here let's get uh before we totally wrap up we do have some more super chats we got to get through uh qui J says there were a few instances in this episode where ventress seemed to be caught off guard by omega's kindness and it made for some nice development for her character yes this show has character moments character development in spades i love it and uh yeah there's no question that it's good well you know, I think Omega has proven herself to be one of the most um, flexible characters as far as having chemistry with other characters. Yes. I mean, it, she has chemistry with every single one of the Bad Batch. She has chemistry with Asajj Ventress, just meeting her. There were great little moments. Ventress called Omega. She said, you're an odd little clone. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just a perfect example yeah. of that chemistry. And, and that that when, when she she said her smile was unsettling. I mean, those are just <laughs> great little character moments like you brought up earlier. Yeah. Jason. Yeah. Uh, Tanya agrees. She says even with her ruthless demeanor, Ventress exhibiting moments of sympathy and resilience is very endearing to me. RFR number one. Tanya is also in the chat each and every week. So thank you, Tanya. And yeah, um, Ventress, you know, again, one of those uh, anti-heroes that we 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 love when we, we sort of root for. Mac was saying that he, he really hadn't in the past, but this might have been the, the kind of a turnaround where you're, you're rooting for Asajj Ventress. Yeah, that is true. That is true. I, I, I found myself rooting for her in this book. Right. Dark Disciple. And again, in this episode, and she shows sympathy. She shows empathy. She she shows all the these, and uh, it's it's uh, it, it's interesting to see the character move forward. I mean, the last time we saw Asajj Ventress was ten years ago. No way! In the really? Clone Wars season five. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. ten years ago. So I mean, it, it doesn't seem like that much time has gone by. But uh, Asajj just slides right back in, and uh, we're more than uh, happy to welcome her back. Lone Star Nat says, RFR number one. I I I think they will tie Ventress and potentially Omega into the path. The path. The path. The path. That sounds like something from a book. Uh, Uh, The path. What is the path? is, did they talk about that in Kenobi, where it was sort of the underground underground railroad road for uh, for sensitives and, and I, Jedi? I think that's exactly what it is. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, because of course you know I mean we we had a, a mention of Quinlan Vos mm-hmm. in uh, the Kenobi series and, and the hidden oh, path right. was because um, the secret he, underground his network symbol was that, etched right his symbol was etched or something like yes. that. And Obi-Wan was like, oh, yeah, I, I know that guy. You know, he's still <laughs> right. around. He's still at work. And and with the connection between Ventress and Quinlan Vos, you know, a reunion between those two would be really uh, something worth following up on. Um, the Hidden Path 
is the secret underground network that uh, uh, worked with, uh, you know, uh, people were sympathetic to the Jedi Order and they were using it to smuggle and hide Jedi who were living life on the down low because of Order 66, you know? Right. So uh, they required a little bit of help. And uh, Quinlan Boss was definitely an active member of that support system. Turtle Wars, uh, boy, we didn't get to this. We had great conversation. We didn't get to the uh, the monster of the week here, but Turtle Wars is is telling us, in case we don't get far enough into the episode to talk much about the sea monster, it was a very cool mashup of various types of cephalopods. The mouth was a near exact replica of a giant squid's beak. Turtle Wars, a great friend of the show. Thanks very much. Uh, appreciate it. And there yeah, they, is an they, RFR Q and A, right, Jim, with Turtle Wars. Um, there's a couple, <laughs> a couple yeah. of them. But where we, uh, what we're looking at turtles, I believe, in one. And, no, well, uh, no, it's not just that. <laughs> I mean, but he does, but he throw does down have the, some the amazing, biology. He has some amazing turtle terrapin tie-ins to Star Wars, <laughs> and it's really good stuff. Um, the big creature. Uh, the Levi- Leviathan they, is the uh, refer to it. It's um, it has a name in the Star the Wars Verathian, universe, right? V- yeah, the Verathian, per the subtitles. Uh, at one point, it says Ver- Verathian growls, <laughs> and uh, that was that you know Ventress summoned that thing along with those luminescent green uh, stingrays, luminescent green. Stingrays. Yeah, say that five times. It would be fast. amazing to drop some of those into the Chicago River on St. Patrick. <laughs> that would be a hoot. But uh, along with those stingrays, she also summoned the Varathian. The Varathian. And tamed it. And when she tamed it, Omega says, You actually did it. And Asaj says, Don't act so surprised. And I thought for sure. It would be a follow-up to that conversation. It, it ended right there, but I, I thought the follow-up should have been Omega saying, I don't believe it, and then Asajj saying, that is why you fail. Oh, that had been a great but callback. That had been a great it callback. It would have been a great one. And in and, and the early days of the Clone Wars, maybe something like that would have happened. I don't think we get those sort of dialogue, Easter eggs, or callbacks. Right. not as much. As much as we used to. Yeah, You know, Star Wars animation has established itself so much since 2008 and the debut of the Clone Wars. Maybe the creators don't feel like they necessarily need to give us those little uh, member berries. But right. uh, I thought that would have been interesting if, if Asajj and Omega had that same dialogue back and forth that Luke and Yoda did on Dagobah, but it didn't. Well, I, I, I certainly appreciate Turtle Wars uh, throwing out like names, or, or, or words like cephalopod, etc. I oh, just I love called it. this character Turtle Puss because he had turtle. a turtle shell and an octopus beak. <laughs> so to me, this will always be Turtle Puss. Turtle Puss. Will that have the shelf life that <laughs> Hog Squaddle had when Kyle Newman came up with that name? Um, hmm, we'll have to think about that. Turtle all right. I like it. I like it. All right. Well, if there's anything left, uh, Jim, it's all yours. Your final thoughts this week. All right. Final thoughts. Season three, episode nine, The Harbinger. The Harbinger. Uh, the first thought I had was, is Wrecker losing weight? Uh, is it Weight Watchers? Jenny Craig? Ozembic? Maybe? Uh, I don't know. It seems like Wrecker seemed a little more slimmed down. I, maybe it's just because he wasn't wearing the bulky clone trooper armor he was he was more in his uh his uh, equivalent of a, a star wars track suit or something i don't know but um i was wondering i, I think wrecker has slimmed down a little bit um with all this talk about m count i started thinking about all the different types of blood that exist type a type b type a b type o you have your positive you have your negative But I would just love to fill out that form at the DMV when I get my driver's license and say I'm type M. See if that flies. I don't think it would. Um, Oh, those little, um, we didn't talk about those little tiny chittering creatures on Pabu 
that uh, that Batcher chased into the the cave. They they are revealed to be known as Munoz. Munoz. And uh, that was something I learned from the uh, subtitles. It says something like Munoz Chitter. And then Lurka Hound took off after. I think, you know, Batcher, the Lurka Hound, I, I, I saw him chase those Munoz. And I was thinking about the way my dog chases a rabbit, you know. My dog, he'll, he'll ignore all sorts of uh, wildlife, you know, squirrels, whatever. They can walk right across his path, even a cat. But uh, you present a rabbit to that dog, he goes crazy. And I, I got similar vibes watching uh, the Lurka Hound Batcher chasing the Munoz. All right. Uh, oh, Asajj, she had a brand new starship. It had uh, two wings. One was longer than the other. I thought it would, like, when she took off in flight, I thought it was going to sort of rotate around like the B-Wing does, but it, it didn't. I mean, she just took off with the one wing larger than the other. And I said, you're scratching my head trying to figure out the aerodynamic purpose of that. And then I just said, you know what, this is Star Wars and physics don't matter. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, once uh, safely on board the Havoc Marauder, after the uh, encounter with the, um, what do you call that thing, Jason? The uh, that 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 big creature in the water. The, the Vrathian. Vrathian. No, no, no. What's oh. your name for it? Oh, I I, I call it Turtle Puss. Turtle Puss. I, I'm trying to establish that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the Turtle Star Puss, Wars of fan course. community swing. So, forget Vrathian ever existed. From now on, Vrathian is Turtle Puss. And uh, I thought, you know, after that encounter with Turtle Puss, um, Omega got on board the Havoc Marauder. First thing she says is, that was fun. <laughs> She's a thrill, little thrill seeker, man. I, I love Omega. And I love, like I said, the chemistry she seems to have with any character that gets put in her path. Uh, Emery, Alice, she has chemistry with all of them. And uh, just a great, really flexible character who seems to be continually evolving episode to episode. Um, we did get some foreshadowing from Asajj Ventress toward the end of the episode, which she warns the Bad Batch to leave Pabu. She's worried. Uh, she isn't worried about the Empire because uh, she says she still has a few lives, which might indicate something to us about uh, the way Night Sisters can cheat death. But... Um, that, and that might come into play when they explain how Asajj has been able to cheat death. But uh, she does warn the Bad Batch to get away from Pabu. And so let's see in the next episode if they take her advice. I predict they don't. And the Empire is going to find them on Pabu. If Asajj could find the Bad Batch, I'm sure the Empire can as well. Speaking of the Empire, where's Grand Moff Tarkin been this season? Hello? Has anybody checked on Stephen Stanton to see if he's okay? I'm sure he is. I'm sure he's doing great. And uh, I, I believe we will see Tarkin before this season is over. But I miss him. I miss Dr. Hemlock and the gang on Mount Tantus. I want to get back involved in the big picture. I, I You know, this, this whole quest to, by the Bad Batch to get more information about M count, etc. I, I think it's reached its peak, and now it's time to get back involved in the big picture story. What's going on with Mount Tantus? What's going on with the clones that are being kept there and experimented on? And will the Bad Batch and their fellow clone troopers who are out there under the command of Captain Rex and Echo these days, will they be able to come together to make a raid on Mount Tantus? That's where I think this season is heading. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the Bad Batch learn about Omega and her connection to the M Count thing, because it's not going to change anything they do is in, in relation to her. They're not going to turn her over, just like Crosshair said. But um, I, more information is forthcoming for all of you out there who said, I didn't learn nothing this episode. This episode was all about bringing Asajj Ventress back into the fold and explaining a little bit more about Omega. 
Jackson. So, and we got that in this episode. Whether or not it was definitive, it doesn't really matter. You can't call this episode filler. No way, Jose. Again, I want to thank Jeff Ulysney, uh, Puppet Lando's producer, for creating the Jake's Take or Plague Steak theme. I gotta, why do I call him Jake from time to time? That's so stupid of me. But, uh, you know, the show is uh, now well over the two hour mark. So anything I say, I can't be held accountable for. <laughs> Puff a pig, not in this episode. Oh, one more thing RFR this Saturday. We do have a weekly show for you guys. You're not going to want to miss it. We got some cool surprises for you. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, uh, Jim, uh, we've got, let's see, Leo. Leo is asking, can we have a Jedi Survivor update before the sign-off? Still plugging away. Yeah. Um, uh, Cal Kestis, I'm still uh, working with him, and uh, we're, we're moving slowly, but surely. Um, I really have only had about half an hour to an hour each week to play the game. And, uh, I mean, it has become part of my schedule now, especially on weekends. I carve away at least an hour or so to play the game. But uh, maybe we'll get there before 2026 or before the next Jedi whatever game comes out. (laughs) See, I think I know why this question was asked. And Jeff Holland brings it up. He says, darn, no RFR bingo got very close. Here's what I think. I think they just wanted to see if you were going to say Cal Ketsis, because if you download the uh, the RFR bingo card, which is available at on the official Facebook group, see if I can bring it up here. I and on Patreon. Can. Oh, it is on Patreon. Here it is. Yes. Here's this RFR. was created. This was <laughs> this was created for the official RFR Facebook group from a loyal RFR listener Paul Stavlo. And uh, he did a great job creating this little um, bingo card, and we shared it with our Patreon audience. Um, you know, some of the uh, the the categories here, I, I, not categories, but uh, squares, the squares yeah. on the bingo card. Uh, some of them include uh, Jason saying, "My good friend and yours from Chicago." Well, that's a given. Um, Tale of the tape, that's a given. Blake steak is another square eric from phoenix calling in first time caller chut chut cal Ketsis, my famous mispronunciation of the <laughs> protagonist from jedi uh, fallen order and jedi survivor cal Ketsis, if i say that you score in bingo there's a dave filoni impersonation on the show we plug factor turtle wars gets a shout out from the super chat Hey, there's a bingo. There's a, a square right there. Your uh, words of wisdom from Tyler Page. Full switchboard. Mentioning curb your enthusiasm. Not this week. FJ DeSanto swearing. Not this week. Patreon plug. Of course. Go to patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. Get bonus podcasts, ad free shows, full show video, and support Rebel Force Radio. Do it today. And also, you get to the front of the line if you're calling into the show. Uh, complimenting Tyler's beard, R.I.P. Uh, Stephen Stanton calling in. Uh, oh. The phone number. Uh, this episode was too dark. Hey, there's a winner for this week. <laughs> meat on the bone. I did not say that this week. I do say that, yeah. But meat, there was uh, there was meat on the bone, but I didn't feel like it was necessary to amplify it uh, in my analysis this week. Puff a pig, not in this episode, every week. And, uh, oh, yeah, sure, you know. The Leon Lucid <laughs> impersonation, you know. We got one of those this week, too. And, you know, me and Swank, we don't know if it's going to happen, and it happens, and we should play the bingo as well. So there's the RFR bingo card. And you can uh, find it, download it, and play at home if you're a member of the official Rebel Force Radio Facebook page or RFR on Patreon, patreon.com. I love it. You know, uh, Jeff Holland is sort of our resident, uh, he, he, he's sort of the statistician of RFR, and I think we oh. just had the longest sign-off in the history of Rebel Force Radio after shows. So, oh, no, there's uh, we, been longer ones. There's really? Longer. I, th- I, I don't know, man. We've, we've looped. I think we're on our third loop of the outro music, so we might have a record winner. 
with this one, but it was just too good. We had to get it all in there. Yeah, you know, it's 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 all so good. I, and I'm looking at my notes just to make sure I didn't leave anything behind. There was something that made me think of Mortis. Oh, yes. When Assange says nature responds to a force user's energy, mm-hmm. I don't think we've ever had it, like, spelled out for us with such clarity in the past. But I thought about Mortis when they're walking through Mortis and the seasons are changing around them. I was like, hmm, that's a, that's kind of a Mortis thing, having nature respond to the energy, mm. you know? I mean, we've seen force users use the force to summon things just like in this episode when they bring on a turtle puss what what do we call that thing turtle puss <laughs> turtle puss you know we see assange you know call out to it but to just see the force responding to a force user's energy without the force user actually extracting that or uh, not extracting uh, um, producing that energy on purpose uh, we see it in Mortis, you know. I just watch when in that first episode when they're walking through Mortis and and they, the the seasons are changing like right in front of them as oh, they're yeah. walking along. You know, and it's like my I it's just, like my commute from uh, Canton to Cleveland. I see all four seasons in that commute every <laughs> every day. It's really in amazing. one drive. In home. One drive. Yeah. He sees all four seasons and goes through about ten mood changes. <laughs> All right, I think we're done. We're, 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 we're out. Thanks for all the great questions. And the bingo card was lots of fun. We will see you later this week on the uh, Rebel Force Radio Weekly Podcast. Huge thanks to Tyler Page, as always. He's so great. And all of the great calls, all of our Patreon supporters. You know where to find us, rebelforceradio.com, patreon.com slash rebelforceradio, podcatcher of choice, all that stuff. Uh, next week, it's a double batch, which means we will be coming to you live on Thursday. Thursday right. night next week for two episodes we'll be looking at. No regular RFR podcast next week, but be here Saturday for that drop. We're out of here. We will see you next time on Rebel Force Radio and the Bad Batch After Show. Love you all so much. For RFR, my name is Jason, and... I'm Jimmy Mac. Well, and what? remember... The Force what? will be with you, always. You didn't pause for the I'm Jimmy Mac? Oh, yeah, no, I, I paused. Should we do Just it again? Or pause. No, right. no. You sure? The, is the is the moment over, Jim? It's over. Oh, I'm so sorry. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> see you next week. All right, guys. See you next time. We're out. <laughs>